This is Todd Neal at the American Stroke Association meeting in New Orleans. Hypertension is a well-known risk factor for stroke, but its treatment in acute stroke remains controversial. Two studies presented here looked at the treatment of hypertension in acute ischemic stroke and acute hemorrhagic stroke. I'm speaking with Dr. Philip Gorelick of the University of Illinois in Chicago about the findings. Dr. Gorelick, could you please explain to me um, what the two studies found that were looking at uh, the treatment of hypertension in patients suffering acute stroke? These are two very important studies because they're key intermedi intermediate steps into our understanding of what to do with blood pressure when patients come in with an acute stroke. One of the studies focused on ischemic stroke, so that's when an artery gets blocked and what to do. We've been always concerned that if we lower the blood pressure in an acute ischemic stroke, we may be reducing pump pressure or perfusion to the brain and we might extend the stroke, so that wouldn't be good. So many of us have allowed the blood pressure to uh, rise up to fairly high levels before we begin treating it. Uh, and that's based on our guideline statements. We allow this uh, through the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines because we want to keep the perfusion pressure up. However, uh, in, in the ischemic stroke study called CHIPS, it was found that by using simple medications that, that we have available for blood pressure control, uh, they were able to safely lower blood pressure, not extend stroke, not increase uh, mortality associated with the stroke. And I think this is a good, important intermediary finding because it's going to lead to the organization of a much larger scale s study to definitively prove this. And why is it important? Because it would be very nice if we know that we can safely lower blood pressure and continue or start blood pressure lowering medicines as soon as a patient uh, comes in with an ischemic stroke. Because what happens is oftentimes we don't have the blood pressure medicines on board because we let the blood pressure rise. And then these patients fall through the cracks in the medical health care system. People forget to restart the blood pressure medicines, and that can be deleterious down the road. So that's the first study, the CHIP study, that had to do with ischemic stroke. The second study, INTERACT, had to do with hemorrhagic strokes. And hemorrhage is a huge problem worldwide and in the United States. It's estimated that there are about a million brain hemorrhages going on throughout the world and about 100,000 in the U.S. And the problem is that these hemorrhages can grow rather rapidly uh, in the ensuing hours after they start and up to about 24 to 36 hours. About 30 to 40 percent of them grow and when they do grow and get large they lead to very high mortality. The death rates with these hemorrhages are up to 50 percent. So we need a way to stunt the growth of these hemorrhages and the way that that may be done is by blood pressure lowering. And so again, we have another study uh, that's showing uh, with blood pressure lowering, you can reduce the size of the hemorrhage, okay? And what needs to be done now is take this intermediate step data, take it on to a large scale clinical trial and then prove more definitively that the blood pressure lowering is safe and effective and stunts the hemorrhage growth. That could save numerous lives worldwide uh, and reduce stroke severity. So we're looking forward to see what the next study will show. So in clinical context, would this be, uh, would it be premature to use the findings from these studies to uh, change guidelines on treating hypertension in acute stroke patients? Well, presently, I think it's important for us to follow the guidelines, and in the U.S., we follow the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines, and for ischemic stroke, and in relation to the CHIP study, we're now recommending that within the first 24 hours or so, it's okay if the patient appears stable to uh, begin blood pressure lowering, okay? However, we still have this upper level uh, of permissive blood pressure, of allowing it to rise as high as 220 over 120 uh, and not treat it unless there's a compelling indication, such as somebody has hypertensive encephalopathy, acute uh, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, uh, aortic dissection, or one of those compelling conditions. Um, I think that we still need to follow the guidelines. I think it's very appropriate and very important. And I don't think we're quite ready to take this data uh, and apply it into practice, although it's very promising. 
but it needs to be validated in a large-scale trial. Um, in relation to the hemorrhage data, um, I think it's very clear that we want to bring blood pressure down uh, when there's a hemorrhage uh, because oftentimes these people have tremendously high blood pressures and so I think the standard for clinical practice will continue to be to bring the blood pressure down. I think this is going to give us more rationale and, and emphasize the importance of why we're bringing it down because it's going to look at hematoma volumes which are critical in terms of predicting who's going to die or have a bad outcome uh, and it's also going to look at uh, neurological outcomes. So it's going to give us some very hard definitive data when the next study is organized and carried out to guide us and give us the rationale that we need for lowering blood pressure. Thank you, Dr. Grelick. I'm Todd Neal, MedPage Today.